How's it going, everybody? Brian Alvarez here on Wrestling Observer Live. We are here every day, Monday through Friday, noon Pacific, 3 Eastern, Sunday, 3 Pacific, 6 Eastern. Friday here on this program, and you normally know what that means. But we got changes coming up here today. Mike Sempervivi is unavailable. He's got, uh, he's got dad stuff to do because I think school starts pretty early for him. His, uh, his young son. Our kids don't go back to school until the end of August. But uh, I know in California people are going to school already. Man, what a life. But anyway, he's busy today, and so I'll be going solo. And we have a lot to get into, which is the news. We have update on the Chris Dickinson lawsuit. We've got uh, Christina Von Erie releasing a statement on that. We've got WWE. Yes, they are bringing back Top Dollar. I got a lot to say about that one. As well as uh, Ashante the Adonis is coming back as well. We've got the Quake by the Lake Dynamite ratings. Show did well, but uh, for a world title match, I mean, certainly could have done better. We'll get into that today. NXT UK, a lot of concern about the future of NXT UK. We've also got the lineup for SmackDown tonight. And perhaps I'll uh, find old Fauntleroy, if we have time, to do the lineup for Rampage, which is taped on Wednesday. SmackDown, of course, is live. And we've got a first-round match in the Women's Tag Team Title Tournament and more. Also, Dave Meltzer joins us in the second segment of the show, the second long segment, at about 20 after. And then at the end of the show, we will be joined by Trevor Murdoch, and he'll be talking the NWA and plenty more. So a lot to get into here today. If you want to text us, 425-780-7566 is the phone number. That is 425-780-7566. You can always email me, brian at wrestlingobserver.com. At Brian Alvarez on Twitter. Back in a moment, Observer Live. Back in the show, Brian Alvarez here, Wrestling Observer Live. Lots to get into here today. Hello to all of our Twitch homies, top tiers. Christina Von Erie has released a statement on social media regarding the defamation lawsuit launched against her and Michaela Coulter by Chris Dickinson. His lawsuit alleges Von Erie and Coulter committed, quote, blatant acts of defamation that wrongfully accuse Mr. Torre of abusive conduct when they released statements in April alleging Dickinson was physically and verbally abusive to them. The statement reads, It has been made public that Christopher Torre, a.k.a. Chris Dickinson, has filed a federal defamation lawsuit in the District of New Jersey against Michaela Coulter, the ex-girlfriend, and myself, another ex-girlfriend. None of the three parties live in New Jersey. Even his attorney's office is based out of Brooklyn, uh, Brooklyn New York. New Jersey has no anti-slap law statute. That has made it very difficult and costly for us to find representation, especially because neither of us live anywhere near there. We fear that if we don't reply to the lawsuit with proper legal representation, not only will it harm us, but it will reinforce that women should be afraid to speak out against their abusers unless they have the resources to also fight them in court. Defamation can only be claimed if there is false information. Everything we have spoken out against is true. That being said, we do not back down. After being sent cease and desist to our jobs and homes, we will continue to stand our ground in the court of law. If anyone has any lawyer recommendations or groups they would recommend to help us fight this, please reach out. Thank you for your support. So that is their side, and you can follow her on Twitter if you want to read more. WWE planning to bring back two members of Hit Row. It's funny because uh, I, I'd heard about this a couple of days ago, and there was a thread on our board, and people were you know, like, oh, man, who's who's he going to bring back next? Top dollar? And I was like, wow, how'd you know that? And sure enough, they had been uh, talking to Top Dalla, and it looks like he and Ashanti the Adonis are going to be at SmackDown on Friday. Obviously, Swerve will not be coming back because he is signed to AEW. And I don't know what's up with B-Fab. She kind of got, uh, uh, I don't know what the proper term would be, but when uh, when Top Dalla went down, they all went down. It's basically what happened. They would be the latest talent acquisitions by the former regime to be brought back by Triple H, joining Dakota Kai, Karrion Cross, Scarlett, and Dexter Loomis. Top Dalla and Ashanti were drafted to SmackDown in the draft, along with B-Fab and Swerve Scott October 1, 2021. 
BFAB was immediately released. Tabdala, Adonis, and Scott were released two weeks later. Prior to the main roster call-up, Hitro operated as a stable in NXT, debuted as a foursome in May of 2021. And Scott, of course, has since signed with AW one half of the World Tag Team Champions. So this act, like it was a good act in NXT. And obviously, you know, by miles, Swerve was the best worker in the group. And, you know, B-Fab had a lot of charisma. Top Dalla had a lot of charisma. Uh, Shanti had a lot of potential. Not as much charisma as the other two, but he had potential. And the the what I heard was, uh, and I did not hear this from like one person. This was this was a lot of people. This is not really a secret. And I think it was talked about when they were released. This top dollar was a heat magnet, dude. He was a heat magnet. And the way it was described to me was, he knows the right people to not be a heat magnet with. And Triple H was one of them. You know, when people talk to Triple H about about Top Dollar, Triple H was like, it's cool to me. And so he pushed him and he did all the stuff that they did. And uh, there was there were a lot of people that that really they didn't like Top Dollar. And so he ended up being released. And uh, now he's coming back. And I listen. Everybody deserves a second chance. Maybe he's going to go into that rock locker room and he'll have learned some lesson or whatever, and he's not going to have that attitude or won't rub people the wrong way. I don't know. All I know is he's back. And listen, hey, there's a lot of potential with this group. So we'll see what happens here. But if it's anything like last time, I mean, there's going to be a lot of discontent about this one. But there's no 100% guarantee it's going to be like last time. Sometimes people live and learn. So that's the story. They're uh, they're apparently back, and we'll see what happens with uh, with B Fab. Quake by the Lake, nine hundred seventy two thousand viewers on TBS, up three point six percent. Second largest audience since June twenty nine, eighteen to forty nine point three three, which was number one on cable, up three percent from last week. And uh, total viewership eighteen to forty nine, almost identical to Fight for the Fallen. And uh, to me. Like, the number's good. It's actually a very good number. It's number one on cable. You can't really complain about that. But, man, I watched that build-up to Chris Jericho and John Moxley. And the build, they only had, like, two weeks of build for that match. But the build was so good that I thought, you know, this should be... It's TV main event, but this this could be a pay-per-view main event. This is a big match. They hadn't faced off in two and a half years. The interim title was on the line. The winner was going to uh, All Out to presumably face CM Punk, and now we know it will be against CM Punk. So, honestly, I would say that this probably underperformed a little bit. I would have expected with that main event, which got a lot of time, by the way, that the show would have done better. But again, 972,000.33, number one on cable. It's nothing anybody needs to panic about, but those are the numbers. NXT UK canceled its next set, two sets of television tapings. BT Sports Studios is said to have been unavailable for the tapings due to the football soccer coverage. I'd heard about this a couple of days ago. Dave noted in the newsletters there's a lot of uneasiness within the NXT UK crew. Next two sets of TV tapings were canceled. As you can imagine with the talent, the reaction is, given the you could tape elsewhere... And shutting down taping is not a good sign. Nobody has been told anything. Uh, flat out, I mean, there were there were people involved in NXT UK that are concerned that it's done. It's going to be shut down. And I don't know if that's the case. I mean, the whole NXT UK, I mean, you can go back to 2008. And I think it was about 2008 where Vince had this idea that he was going to open up these promotions all over the world. And he was just basically, it was the way he the, he uh, he tried to, and he did, kill the territories in the 80s. He was going to try to kill all the territories around the world. He was, it was, WWE was going to be global. There was going to be a, a WWE Japan, which obviously was to take a hit on all the companies in Japan. There was going to be Europe and uh, South America. And it never happened, okay? But obviously, there's a reason that NXT UK started up. And now that Vince is gone... And Triple H is, I mean, he's bringing back his guys. Uh, this next set of, of tryouts is likely going to be uh, involving a lot of indie talent. Triple H is not averse 
to bringing in great indie talent that can work. And the reality is, where do you get that talent? Well, you have to have a vibrant wrestling scene around the world. So don't report Brian saying it's shutting down and this is why. I don't know if it's shutting down. And if it does, I don't know if this is why. But what I'm saying is, I can see a situation where, what's the point of NXT UK? To keep growth of of other promotions in the UK? Dude, he needs talent from all over the world. He's going to need it for the foreseeable future. You don't need NXT UK. You could bring all the best guys to NXT here in the US. You could bring some of them to the main roster. I mean, it, it's only there to prevent growth elsewhere in the UK and Europe. And we'll see what happens, but obviously it's true. Uh, sh- canceling two sets of television tapings when you could tape, probably not a good sign. And a talent does not believe it's a good sign. Obviously, the official reason is the studio's unavailable. And hey, for all I know, that might be the entire reason it's, it's, uh, it's being shut down for the next two sets of tapings. But that's what people are talking about, so that's the story. Tonight, SmackDown... Gunther defends the Intercontinental title against Shinsuke Nakamura. We've got Raquel and Aaliyah versus Shotzi and Zia Lee for the Women's Tag Team title tournament. And Liv Morgan and Shayna Baszler will have a contract signing, because if there's one thing we still love in this company, it's contract signings. So that's coming up tonight. And I'm pretty confident, barring injury or illness, we'll actually see what's advertised, as we have every single week since Vince was out of there. Back in a moment with Big Dave, Observer Live. Back in the show, Brian Elber is here, Wrestling Observer Alive. No Mike Sempervivi, and we cannot find Dave. So, we are going to do uh, mailbag, Q&A, and uh, whatever else you guys want to talk about. So, uh, let's uh, put the info out here. If you want to text us, 425-780-7566. That is 425-780-7566. Brian at WrestlingObserver.com. At Brian Alvarez on Twitter. And uh, don't forget, Trevor Murdoch is going to be on in the next segment of the show. So if you have questions for him, you're welcome to send those as well. And uh, I'm afraid, you know who else is not available today? Fauntleroy. And so I am going to read the spoilers for the Rampage. Not the spoilers, the lineup. For the Rampage show tonight. Because, of course, we do not read spoilers here on this program. I'm going to do my best to read them so that you won't know what happens. And to be fair, I don't remember what happened. So don't accuse me, the way I read this, of uh, of spoiling anything. So we have got uh, the return of Brian Danielson. And he will speak as well. Hook will speak. We have got the Gun Club versus what is billed as Bearhausen, although it is Danhausen and Eric Redbeard, who I don't think is one of Bear Country, although maybe he's a uh, Bear Country that we're uh, unaware of. We have got Sunny Kiss versus Parker Boudreaux. You guys remember Parker Boudreaux? The former Harlan will be facing Sunny Kiss tonight. Swerve in our glory will speak. We've got Orange Cassidy versus Ari Daivari, which of course builds to the six-man uh, tournament matches. And we have got Sammy Guevara and Ty Mello versus Dante Martin and Sky Blue. Ty, Ty Nara Conti uh, is now Ty Mello. She used to be Ty Nara Conti, but Conti was her name from a previous marriage, which she kept. But then she got married to Sammy Guevara, and now she will be using Ty Mello instead of Ty Conti. Got that? That is for the AAA World Mixed Tag Team titles. Uh, Sammy and Ty versus Dante Martin and Sky Blue. So that's the lineup for Rampage. And listen, I haven't seen the show, obviously. But, you know, one of the things we've been talking about with Rampage is there's a lot going on on that show. And uh, there's seven segments, seven segments scheduled for a one-hour show, which is 42 minutes when you remove commercials. So if I may, you know how I, you know how I feel about math. 
Uh, that is approximately six minutes per segment on the show that's coming up tonight, which seems like a lot. Maybe I'm not the only one. But anyway, that's the lineup for that show coming up tonight. So SmackDown and Rampage tonight. And obviously, both of them have got uh, they got big shows coming up. SmackDown building up Clash at the Castle. And then uh, WWE will be building up. Oh, no, WWE's Clash at the Castle and AW is all out. All right. This person here says, are you excited for NXT Heat Wave? Well, shall we do the card for Heat Wave while we're at it here? NXT Heat Wave. Of course, I spell it all wrong here. NXT Heat Wave. All right, here's the lineup for the show. August 16th. So we're, uh, yeah, it's this coming Wednesday. The lineup for the show, Braun Breaker versus J.D. McDonough. Not a fan of the uh, build at all. In fact, with the exception of the video package on uh, Wednesday, the build has been horrible. But I, I was intrigued by the video package, which showed J.D. McDonough doing katas and yoga on the side of a bridge. I was entertained by that. I think as a match, I mean, J.D. McDonough is a good worker, so they should have a good match. But I, like, I can't say that I care at all about this match. We have Mandy Rose versus Zoe Stark for the NXT title. I think 100% we need a title change here. I think Zoe Stark needs to win the title. I think that it's been a, a good story where uh, Mandy, Gigi, and JC injured Zoe like eight months ago. And she made her big return, and she returned in that battle royal, and she won. And they did a great job on that battle royal, and she beat Cora Jade on this past week's show. And then... Uh, now she goes on to win the title. I think it's time to uh, move Mandy on to other things, whether that be Raw, SmackDown, or whatever. I think we've uh, we've run our course here with this one. Roxanne Perez and Cora Jade in a grudge match. And I would say that uh, I think that Cora is going to win because I think that uh, it's a singles match. There are no stipulations. The feud has just started. Cora Jade just did a job on Wednesday. Roxanne wins. What more do you want to see? She'll have gotten her revenge. So I think that, that Cora should win the match somehow, and then you can build towards a rematch, because I think they're still going to be doing that, that big show over uh, All Out Weekend. They're going to need some matches. So Roxanne, Cora, Stip Match... I think that's that's the way to go. So give uh, Corey the win here. Carmelo and Giovanni Vinci for the NXT North American title. I think this match is going to be great. Probably going to be the best match on the show. And I would expect Carmelo to retain the title. You could put the title on Giovanni, but then what? Uh, I think that there's a lot more you can do with Carmelo, Trick Williams. I think it'll be a very, very good match. Maybe even a great match. Carmelo wins, retains the title. And then the main event. I actually don't know if this is going to be the main event, but it's my main event. Santos Escobar versus Tony D'Angelo. And it is a street fight. And the story is, if Escobar wins, Legado del Fantasma is free from the D'Angelo family. So everything that they did to put them together will be split. If D'Angelo wins... Santos Escobar is banned from NXT television, and Tony D'Angelo will uh, uh, re retain the control of Legado del Fantasma. So uh, there's only two things that can happen right here. Number one, Santos Escobar wins. They split off, and off they go their separate ways, and they do whatever in NXT. My uh, suggestion would be Tony D'Angelo wins and Santos Escobar goes up to the main roster and becomes a big superstar with a main roster contract and makes a lot of money and is rewarded for his years of hard work. If you asked, if you demanded me, I won't say any weapons to my head, but who do I think is going to win? I actually cannot tell you. Because clearly, clearly... Before Hunter took over, when Vince was still in charge, 
I don't think there were any plans of calling Santos up to the main roster. I think that what they did was, we'll do this match. The groups will be good put together. They can't coexist. We'll do another match. Santos will get his win back. And then they'll split and go their separate ways. I think that was the plan. And so if if there are no intentions of calling him up to the main roster, then they'll just continue on with the plan. I think that, and here's here's actually why I would bet that uh, that Santos wins, okay? If you're calling Santos Escobar up to the main roster, why wouldn't you call up all of Legado del Fantasma? The entire act is great, and they're a great tag team. They can do six-man matches. They're far better as a unit than as a than Santos just going up as a singles and these guys just doing whatever down here. I guess if you you could say, well, we're going to bring Santos up now. We're going to bring the other two guys up later, but we're going to leave him down right now to try to teach all these other tag teams how to work, which there should be people down there doing. And then after they've, you know, helped everybody for another 6-8 months, they show up to help Santos get a big win or whatever and you reunite them. There's a lot of ways you can go. But I, I do, I've talked about this since long before uh, Vince McMahon stepped away. What's this guy doing here? What's Santos Escobar doing down there? I mean, all they have wanted forever was a Hispanic superstar. They wanted th- this person to be a good wrestler, good looking, speak English. He speaks perfect English. He's a good looking guy. He's a good worker. He can have great matches. The only thing, literally the only thing that he was missing was height. And now Vince is gone. And so it's not so important to have height if you've got everything else. So what the hell is this guy doing here? He should be on the main roster. He should be a huge star. I'm afraid he ain't coming up yet. But we shall see. I could be wrong. I've been wrong uh, a time or two. This person here says, Miro could cost the House of Black in the trio's tournament. Maybe some of the Dark Order members get attacked. Hangman has to fill in as the third member. You could do it that way, but, I mean, I think an easy story is the Young Bucks and Kenny Omega versus the Dark Order managed by Hangman. So Hangman has to manage his friends against his other friends. What's he going to do? What are his other friends going to think about this? I mean, the whole the whole issue, I mean, there's a lot of ways you can go if they go to the finals. And everybody was like, well, how, why, why would the Dark Order beat the House of Black? Well, I mean, as noted here, Miro could cost the House of Black the match. I know people probably wouldn't be happy with them being eliminated, but it's time to pull the trigger on this Miro thing. And I think it's a great story if Hangman has to manage his friends against his other friends. After he just made up with his other friends, now he's got to try to beat them. Back in a moment with more Observer Live. Back in the show, Brian Alvarez here, Wrestling Observer Live. You won't believe this, or maybe you will. Now I can't find Trevor Murdoch. So, Mike Sempervivi, gone. Dave, gone. Fauntleroy, gone. And now, Trevor Murdoch is gone. I'm trying to set it up for uh, Monday, maybe. What a what a classic show we've got here. Should I just sing a little for the rest of the show? Should I put on a concert? What should I do here? Eh, we got plenty of uh, plenty of text messages. So let's get into it. Let's see what else we've got here. I tune in a few minutes late, so sorry if you covered it. But thoughts on Goldberg saying he is done apologizing to Bret Hart? Well, I haven't heard it. I know a while ago he was he was a little bit agitated about it because he said, you know, I, I apologized over and over for years, and this guy won't forgive me. So, I mean, I don't know. This this is this is on Goldberg and, and Bret Hart, not on me. I mean, if he feels he's apologized sincerely for years and the guy still has not accepted his apology, then probably is time to move on. I don't know what else you can do, but... I don't know who has said what. I don't know what's gone on between them. I don't know anything, so can't really comment on that. Hey, look at this. Never happened before. And I hung up on him. Classic. I've been doing this for 25 years. Let's try this again. I'll actually dial. 
Please leave your message for... Oh, my God. Five, eight, zero. I don't quit. Watch this. Trevor? Hello? Hey, it's Brian Alvarez. Hey, Brian, how are you? I believe our times got mixed up on my end. I was, uh, I was told 3 o'clock uh, my time, 4 o'clock your time. So oh, man. Oh, man. Well, I apologize for that. But we're live now. You want to go for uh, 15 minutes? Well, of course. Yeah, man. Can you guys hear me okay? I, I can hear you great. we got a lot to talk about here today. You've got a, uh, got a big championship match coming up, the NWA 74th anniversary show. You and Tyrus on night two for that title. What are your thoughts on this match? Yes. Man, Billy Corrigan brought out all the big dogs for this one. Um, you know, Tyrus is a mountain of a man, and he's in NWA currently undefeated. Um, it's it's probably going to be the biggest fight of my life, legitimately. Um, if you look at Tyrus, he's probably one of the biggest guys in pro wrestling right now. And uh, so it's, it's going to be one hell of a hoss fight. Um, not to mention, I don't get into the ring – with too many guys that are bigger than me, uh, so that's going to be that's going to be interesting. Tyrus isn't a guy you can just instantly pick up and throw around, you know, four hundred plus pounds. Um, but I'm I'm ready for the fight, though, Brian. I'm I'm the NWA World Heavyweight Champion, and I want the biggest, the baddest, the meanest, the strongest, the fastest. I want it all because at the end of the day, I want to look back at my reign and say I did it right. Now I gotta I gotta talk about some some real life stuff here because uh, obviously you're uh, I hate to break kayfabe but your real name is not Trevor Murdoch but uh, um, yeah very so gotta go into all of that but yes 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 but I I would like to know I would like to know the Trevor Murdoch I mean listen I watched a lot of Dick Murdoch and uh, the actual guy I mean you can say what you want about the actual guy but as a as a wrestler in the ring this dude was out of this world absolutely out of this world and uh when you when you got into this business i mean tell us about the the trevor murdoch name i mean was this something where you grew up a fan and you happened to have a resemblance was this something where you had a resemblance and so one of your trainers was like ah you should be trevor murdoch how, how exactly <laughs> did you uh uh get the name um, I'm a I'm a fan of old school wrestling. Um, a fan of the NWA. I was a fan of Harley Race, um, which naturally brings you to you know watch you know being a fan of Dickie Harley and and Dickie used to be real close. Um, and I was also a fan of Dusty Rhodes. So when you're watching, looking for taped footage as a young guy as you're training, and you're watching matches, you you can't do nothing but help come across Dick Murdoch's uh, matches. And the guys would always kind of bust my chops a little bit and say, man, you could be his kid. Because at the time, I was doing Trevor Rhodes, son of Dutty Rhodes. That's right, yeah. To, yeah, Harley, that's what, you know, Harley had me do. I had the blonde hair, and we had permission from Dusty. Uh, but when I got my chance with WWE, when I got a tryout, Ricky Steamboat was my producer, and I had known him from WLW, Harley's company, when Harley would bring him in. And he goes, uh, Trevor, he goes, you got a shot tonight. He goes, Dusty's got a little bit of heat right now. And it may not be good for you to get an opportunity with the, using the last name Rhodes. He goes, you should try Murdoch. He goes, you look more like Dickie Murdoch's boy anyway. And I said, shit, Ricky, I don't care what you call me. I was like, if it gets me an opportunity, um, it, you know, I'll do it. So I went out as Trevor Murdoch and uh, ended up getting my job at WWE, and it just stayed that way. And I was completely content with that because there's no other Murdochs out there anymore. And when people talk to me and ask me about it, it gives me an opportunity to kind of uh, spread the love of Dickie Murdoch and explain, you know, who he was and kind of keep him alive a little bit in this generation of pro wrestling. So did you then, after getting that, that gimmick, sort of go back and watch some of it and, and uh, you know, kind of – Maybe try to pattern yourself a little bit after him, or or what did you do from that point? When when I went, you know, with WWE, I did watch I did watch more of his matches, and I tried to do some of his um, his nuances. 
But to be honest with you, being a Harley race guy, I was already pretty, I was trained in his, uh, I already worked like Dickie. I already wrestled like Dickie because it was, Dickie wrestled a lot like Harley at times. Um, so it, it really wasn't like a hard transition. I just paid attention more to uh, a couple of things that, you know, Dickie would do to, to either get a crowd reaction out of the people or to, you know, some of his, you know, Dickie had one hell of a right punch, you know, and, and I would watch that and try to mimic that because, it, you know, it looked uh, real. And, you know, that's our job as pro wrestlers is to make the audience believe what's going on. And that's, you know, Dickie, when you would watch him wrestle, you would, you, you know, legitimately when he would turn it on, you could, you believed he was hurting somebody. Oh, man, I, I would watch his matches and, and uh, I, I've watched, uh, I've watched MMA and UFC all my life. And obviously what he did, you know, it wa- it wasn't like a real fight, but he had a way of working where, you know, you could believe if if it was real, this is what it would look like. He's in there just pounding on guys and just hard hitting and and that brain buster was just unbelievable. I was a big fan of of uh, of Dick Murdoch's work. Well, and that he he had that common man, you know, I know Dusty, that was his gimmick, but, it, you know, he, I don't know, there was something about Dickie where, like, he, he reminded me of guys I know in my hometown. They may not have looked like an athlete. They may not have looked as if they could uh, take on the world, but he was usually, those, those are the guys that everybody's like, just don't mess with him. Just leave him alone because he'll do whatever he's got to do to get his point across, whether it's to punch in the mouth, bite your ear off, whatever it takes, that's the guy you don't want to mess with. And that's the feeling I always had with Dickie. He's just, if you walked out of a bar, that's not the guy you want to see standing outside. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. Now, now for a while before this uh, this NWA run and, and eventually becoming the champion, I mean, you had retired for a little while. What happened? I had, um, I had just, you know, it, I was helping out, working with Harley, trying to help him keep things going um, there towards the end. I, I really, I really wanted to do what I could to help continue WLW and to help kind of carry things on and to, to try to do my best to make his end of life the best as possible. Um, so I invested a lot of time with that, and which that would take away from my wrestling and. You know, when Harley passed, it was, it, I don't know, I felt like it was kind of a sign that, like, maybe Trevor, you know, you kind of went full, full circle here a little bit. And when you're burying your your mentor, your your best friend, um, it just felt like an ending for me. It felt like a good time to walk away and nobody would, would bust my balls or, or, you know, give me a hard time about it. They would all understand. Um, but the pro wrestling gods uh, had something else in mind because at Harley's funeral, uh NWA did an amazing thing. They sent uh, one, and they didn't send, they came, but Nick Aldis was the world champion at the time, and Dave Lagana was the executive producer at the time, and they both showed up to Harley's funeral to pay their respects and to, to show that, you know, he was the NWA, you know, to pay their respects. And um, they cornered me and asked me what I was doing, and I kind of gave them the same answer. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a round peg in a square world. And it's uh, maybe it's time for me to, to call it a day. And uh, they said, well, you come on down. Why don't you come down to power? We're doing this TV show. Come down. We'll have you do a, be a producer. Hey, you know, maybe you'll wrestle a match. It's, you know, you know, we'll have you do some back. Just come down. We need your experience. And um, I got down there and I walked in the building. And the first person I see is Dave Lagana. And the first thing that guy asked me, he goes, did you bring your gear? And I said, well, yeah, I, I always bring my gear. Of course I, you, know, you always bring your gear. I, I'm a wrestler. I'm an OG. I just, it's always in the trunk. If I'm going to a show, you never know. Uh, but I ended up wrestling Ricky Starks that night, man. And uh, I came in the back, and uh, Billy Corgan was there, Nick Aldis was there, Dave Lagan was there, and they're like, hey, you know, you you got a whole lot more in the tank. We've already got you booked for tomorrow night. And one night, you know, one night turned into two, two turned into three. You know, now I'm NWA World Heavyweight Champion four years later. What are your thoughts on on Nick Aldis? Because you won the title from him, and uh, you know there's a lot of cliches in wrestling. One of them is he's he's a consummate pro wrestler. But man, when you when you see Nick Aldis, 
It's like, that guy is, you know, the consummate old school pro wrestler. I mean, he looks great. He's always got his suit. He's He plays the role of the world champion perfectly. I was always very impressed with him. What are your thoughts? Um, Nick is a very talented individual. Nick is 100% in, all in. Um, he... He uh, he goes out there and he represents very well. He works his ass off in the ring. Um, Nick is a very cunning individual. He's a very smart individual. Um, you have to be when you're you know if you want to stay on top. As long as Nick stayed on top, um, but you know Nick has has done a great job of of creating a brand not only for himself but also helping with the NWA. So you've got uh, this run here for the past couple of years, and you talked about NWA Power, which uh, I actually think I saw that match with you and Starks, and I think it might have been the first time I ever saw Ricky Starks. And I was like, holy smokes, yep. look at this kid. And now here he is. It was, it was in those early episodes. It yeah. Was probably in the, it was the second episode of Power, I think it was. Yeah. So if, yeah. if you could recommend uh, some episodes of Power, like what are, what are some of your favorite matches uh, in about a minute here from this, uh, this NWA run? Any, anything with Tom Latimer. Um, you want to talk about a guy who goes out and goes hard, like really gives 100% is um, me and Tom Latimer, man, anything between him and I uh, is some of my favorite work period in the business because uh, Tom's one of those guys that's not afraid to take a punch to give a punch. And when you've got that mentality, it's really a you know win-win for the fans because you see two brutes go out there and just beat the snot out of each other. Um, so anything with Tom Latimer – um, my stuff with, Well, actually, uh, uh, hold that thought because we have to end a break. We'll do one more when we come back. Back in a moment, Observer Live. Back in the show, Brian Alvarez here, Wrestling Observer Live. Joined by Trevor Murdoch here today, NWA 74th anniversary show. It's actually two shows. It'll air on August 27th and 28th on pay-per-view, St. Louis, Missouri. Trevor here defending the NWA World Heavyweight title at the Chase Course on Ballroom. That's history there, Trevor. So much history. So many legends have walked through those hallways and stepped into that ballroom. Uh, the fact that I've not only got a chance in the main event for the World Heavyweight title once there, but I'm now going back twice. And this time I'm defending it against Tyrus. Uh, man, there's nothing but pride and joy going on in my heart. Uh, you know, that, that's a really special building. It's a really special place. St. Louis is my hometown where I was born and raised. So it's going to be one hell of a night, August 28th. Me and Tyrus going for the World Heavyweight title. That's right, August 27th and 28th. The title match is on the 28th. NWATix.com. If you would like to go, if you're in St. Louis, you can go to the famous Corson Ballroom and watch an NWA World Heavyweight Championship title defense. And uh, Trevor, very quickly, before we go, any social media you'd like to get out? Man, believe it or not, this redneck does have some social media, yeah. Oh, Trevor's on Instagram and Twitter, at the Real T Murdoch. And, of course, on Facebook, I've got my finally, after 10 years, I'm over enough to get a little blue check mark next to my name. Oh, man. Now you Forget that NWA <laughs> title. Now you know you've made it. You got that yeah, blue man, no, check mark. Nobody, nobody's trying to pretend to be this guy, so it's got to be real. That's true. That's, well, listen, I want to wish you the best of luck against Tyrus. Get out there and defend that title. And thanks so much for doing the show today, and best of luck with everything. Brian, thank you very much, man. I love you guys. I listen to you all the time, so it's really a pleasure to be on your guys' program. Well, I really appreciate it. Hopefully we can do this again soon. And, of course, thanks, everybody, for listening here today. We are out of time. We'll be back later on this weekend with more Wrestling Observer Live.